My name is Anthony Fatsies and welcome to the What The Finance podcast, where we interview finance, trading and investing experts to help you understand current market trends and learn about the intricacies of new and existing assets. If you enjoy the podcast and to help with the YouTube algorithm, please like, comment and subscribe. It really helps with the podcast and it means we can continue to get amazing guests. Thanks again. And I hope you enjoy. So, Glenn, thank you so much for joining the What the Finance podcast to talk with me today. Uh, and, and you know, just onto my first question: What was your influence for writing the book? My influence writing the book. Um, you mean like a, a person, or or what it, events influenced it? Yeah, it could be events, a person, just anything where you're like, okay, I I should write a book now and share my experiences with others. Um. I think it was the the top of the market in 2017 because I called the top as I like to show off about in the book <laughs> because uh, <laughs> you know I I called it you know right there I didn't sell immediately as as I expect you know from having uh, read through the book um but you know I saw the first warning sign and I wrote about it on Facebook now here's the thing right um when I was just a normal trader, trading stocks and shares, futures, commodities, uh, all that kind of thing, which I did, first of all, part time while I was a TV reporter. And then when I started making enough money, I started doing it full time. And, um, you know, when I was doing that, if I'd called the top of the market like I did, you know, fairly often for different markets, um, I thought nothing of it because there were so many other professional traders out there you know, saying clever things and getting things right and blah, blah, blah. But in the crypto space, <laughs> what was really noticeable was that I was one of very few little voices going, I think this is the top of the market. Whereas most of the big influencers, the ones called things like crypto god lord and crypto, the crypto kid with, with his pistol shooters or whatever, you know, they're all called stupid names. They're all avatars. You, you've seen them. They still exist in, and they have huge Twitter accounts and huge YouTube followings often. And um, these people just, they don't know what the hell they're doing most of the time. I mean, literally, they're just making it up as they go along. They've been trading like a couple of years and they haven't bothered to learn anything very much apart from a few little things they've picked up on the internet and they think that they're trading experts well you know there are lots of good analogies but would you go out and fly a plane uh solo on the first day that you decided to become a pilot and you like hit the controls for the first time and you're like oh, let's fly this baby no you would get somebody to teach you properly for a very long time right this this is the thing and it's the same with everything you know would you be a surgeon on the first day you started at medical school and start cutting someone up Trading, for some reason, is one of those things where people think, oh, I can do this straight away. But you can't. OK, it's a skill that has to be learned. And there are various complex aspects to it, like risk management and position sizing that make all the difference between becoming a big success and becoming a massive failure and losing all your money. And sure enough, following the crypto boom in 2017, I sold all Bitcoin and all my cryptos. So did a lot of my followers, I hope. And um, then there was a massive crypto winter where the prices of most cryptos fell like 95% or so. Bitcoin fell only, only 85%. But you know, most people lost all of the money that they'd put in or nearly all of it. And what people often forget is that, you know, they go, oh, well, you can just hold through the downturns. Easier said than done, okay? Most people fail at that. And the statistics are there to prove that most people fail at that because most people were selling at the very bottom after an 85% fall, right? That's that's where the big volume was. That's where most of the selling went on. People panic. They're like, oh no, my wife's gonna kill me. Oh no, I can't afford to pay the mortgage. You know, whatever it happens to be. And they just feel like Bitcoin's never coming back and they have to sell. That's how it feels at the bottom of bear markets. So anyway, to cut a very long story short, um, I was inspired to write the book because, uh, well, publishers approached me uh, and they'd seen that I had a big Facebook following and that um, I had uh, called the top of the market. And I was already thinking about writing a book for that reason, to teach people the stuff they don't know and to save a lot of people a lot of heartache. Uh, and so, yeah, the two things came together. I wrote the book came out in 2019 and it's and it sold um really really well this year and last year really well
Yeah, I can imagine, especially with the uh, bull run we're seeing now. And did you get a lot of backlash, like calling the top? I'm, I'm guessing because, you know, it's very tribal crypto, I think, and people, you know, they love it and they love to support and they love to think it's going to go up forever. So did you get a lot of backlash from calling? Well, luckily for me, I wasn't really in the crypto community too much. I mean, yeah, I spoke at various conferences. I still speak at various conferences. So I know some of the people, but I know the more reputable people. I don't know these avatar people who have hundreds of thousands of followers uh, on Twitter. I, I, you know, I might see their tweets every now and then in my feed and get irritated by them. But uh, I don't actually talk to them because I could just see they're just talking nonsense all day to hundreds of thousands of people just lapping up their absolute rubbish. Um, as you can tell, it kind of annoys me because I'm, I'm an evangelist for the, you know, for the, the good news. I'm trying to teach people the way that it can be done, the way that I've been making a living at it for donkey's years. You know, making a living, making a good living and supporting my family, you know, year after year after year. That's what trading's all about, not like desperately hoping that you're going to suddenly 300 times your money in five seconds. I mean, that can happen. And indeed, I've had a couple of cryptos that have gone, where are we now? Round about 50, 100 times my initial investment. You know, it can happen. But the truth is that it's a bit of a lottery trying to trade like that. Yeah, you look for the big winners and, you know, you can buy 100 of them and 99 of them will fail. And then maybe one of them will go up times 100, but then you've lost all your money on the other 99. So you kind of end up quits. That's what happens to, to some people who've tried that kind of method. You know, the ones you hear about are the ones who were lucky and were just like, yay, I got 100 times, I got 200 times. Um, you don't hear about the... 99 out of 100 people who try that and aren't lucky because they don't write, you know, tweets that go viral saying, I put a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds into so and so crypto and now it's only worth like 50 pounds. Like nobody cares because that happens all the time to people the whole time. Mm. So, uh, so you just don't hear those stories very often. You get the impression that the big winners are quite common. They're not. Yeah. And I think you were, we, uh... I know I follow Wall Street bets, which I'm sure a lot of people that's like been the classic one the last year. And they do share some of the the horrifying like stories where people, you know, they lose their college loans or they lose all these different things where they've just put a ridiculous call, basically, as you said, a lottery, a bet, you know, hoping that it will go up. It's gone the opposite way and they lose 95, you know, 98 percent of all their, uh, all their amounts, which is right, crazy. At least Reddit has some of those um, some of those kind of warning stories. Though, as I say, it's the more mundane stories that I think people would really need to really get it through your head that this is a dangerous game um, in a very kind of mundane sense. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that it's a very mundane event that some mm -hmm. guy, usually a guy, let's face it, invests a thousand pounds in some piece of rubbish and then loses 90 percent of it. You know, that happens so often. And, though you know, I'd like to see Reddit populated with 50,000 stories exactly like that. I invested a thousand. I lost 95 percent of it. Now I haven't got much. Has it ruined my life? No, but it's annoying. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> those are the most common stories, but you never hear them. But that's what's happening to most people most of the time. So, um you know, if people could understand that that's the common situation and that there are ways to avoid that by doing the kind of stuff that I do, the kind of stuff that I teach in my book, the kind of stuff I talk about on Twitter. You know, I haven't invented any kind of magic. There's a couple of hundred years worth of trader experience to draw upon. I've read, you know, dozens of books. And when I was younger as, a, as an early trader trying to make a million mistakes and work my way through to some kind of success, I found that there are decent methods, ones that people have developed over many, many decades. Why on earth would anybody want to reinvent the wheel now and pretend that they're going to invent trading from scratch? It's just silly. Silly. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's right. I completely agree. And I think, you know, it's a classic Warren Buffett quote. I think he talks about, you know, the most successful investors, are the one that consistent over 20, 30 years, there can be people like in crypto, they win a year or two and they think they're the best traders in the world. But as you said, it's the consistency over, you know, I think you've been doing it for 20 years and that's what you really, the best traders do that. Yeah, well, exactly. And, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit that I was losing money uh, in the early days. You Again, you probably saw that in my book, but I was, uh, I was losing, um, well, I lost all my savings initially or, or, or you know, almost a lot. So um, 
I had some bad experiences right at the beginning. And and what's more, the dot com boom and crash, um, where I lost lots of money twenty years ago, was very similar to crypto. The same kind of excitement, same kind of hysterical overvaluations of things that really aren't worth that much money. Ultimately, um, the desperate hoping that that the price will come back up after it's gone down, and then you buy some more and you buy some more. Dollar cost averaging, pound cost averaging. You probably hear these terms fairly often in investing trading. You know that pound cost averaging is a strategy where you're buying on the way down to average down your price, your buying price. Um, it is a strategy that can be used judiciously and sometimes is, but I think a lot of the time it's just used as, as an excuse to avoid facing the horrible feeling of, oh, I've made a terrible mistake. So instead you double down on that mistake and then you triple down on that mistake and you keep making that mistake worse and worse until you've lost all your money. That's, that's what I did back in the dot-com crash. And I don't wanna see other people doing it now. So, you know, people write to me every day who've read my book, and I uh, and um, they thank me for stopping them making that mistake. That's that's kind of what makes it worthwhile for me. I didn't do it for money. Don't make much money out of. Believe me, even if you sell a lot of books, um, once once the publishers and Amazon and so on have taken their cuts, uh, unless you're J.K. Rowling, you're not you're not going to make much money out of writing a book. So I I didn't do it for that. I did it because because I want to spread the message. Because I hate to see so many people being made fools of. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned, yeah, that, that story where you sort of broke all your rules, you invest, invested in this very speculative company that basically went to zero after the dot-com boom. Um, and yeah, and as you said, in the book, it took you quite a while to, for the trade to really click. So, you know, was there a point that really stands out where it all clicks for you and you're like, okay, this is, you know, I finally turned the corner where I think I can do this consistently? Uh, yeah, that turning point for me came in 2008, uh, 2007, eight. Uh, you'll remember the great financial crash. Even our even our younger viewers will probably have vague memories of their parents sweating and and being worried and losing their jobs and lovely things like that. Um, it was the subprime mortgage disaster in America. You may may remember. Now, what was interesting about this was that I was ahead of the curve. Now, even though I'd been trading for seven years, I was still not very confident because you know when you're a trader or an investor, you're effectively against the best people in the world. The one, you know, it's like you're playing Serena Williams at tennis. It's, um, you know, it's really hard to feel good at it because you're, because you see other people, the, the, the people who you follow or who have blogs or, you know, back in those days and um, those kind of people, you know, are so good at it and so professional that it makes you feel like you're still an amateur even after seven years. But, you know, it's that feeling of feeling you're still an amateur that kind of keeps you learning. So it's kind of a good and important feeling, keeps you aiming to be one of the best. So um, 2007, eight, I suddenly found myself with an unpopular opinion, which is that the market doesn't look like it's heading in the right direction. Now, 2007, Northern Rock, you may remember, uh, collapsed and there were people queuing outside the building society or, or bank or, you know, and queuing outside these places to try and um, uh, because everybody was panicking, not just for Northern Rock, but banks as well. And, you know, there was uh, there was a lot of panic and worry that other banks would go down. Um, Northern Rock was taken over by the government temporarily. And um, and, you know, that happened in 2007. And it was partly caused by the subprime mortgage problems in the United States in a sort of indirect kind of fashion. And, um, you know, I expected the stock market to fall, but it didn't. It just went up more. I was like, well, what's going on? This doesn't make sense. And it wasn't that I thought it had to crash because I didn't know what was going to happen the following year any more than anyone else did. But obviously I was worried because of the events that were happening in the real world. And yet the market continued to climb. So as a trend following trader, my stocks continued to climb, but then they started faltering Then they started, it, it didn't quite work out. Basically you had a kind of sideways period in the market. And um, the way that the pattern was forming, it was going sideways, but in a kind of what we call a rounded top, kind of like that, right? Actually, I should do it the other way, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, like that, uh, which often presages a, a crash. Not always, but often. So I started thinking, um, if 
if there's going to be a crash, then I could start shorting. Because I did spread betting and still do spread betting, which is uh, you know a way of trading in the United in the United Kingdom, which uh, means that you don't have to pay tax on your profits, uh, but effectively it's still you know buying and selling shares or whatever at the same prices or more or less the same prices as you would be if you're doing it normally. Um, but it allows you to go short to make money out of prices falling as well as making money out of prices rising. You could do either. You can go long or short. So um, I decided I was going to start shorting things like, well, banking shares were obviously the ones that I was most interested in. But because I look at the charts and pay attention to what they're telling me, I wasn't ready to go short. What I was doing was progressively selling all of the shares that I had built up over months and years. Why? Not because I was scared, but because the charts were telling me to sell those shares. One after the other, they started breaching. Uh, basically, their trends started to end. So, you know, you'd be going up for years and then be like, oh, 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 suddenly it doesn't look like it's supposed to anymore. And it doesn't look quite like a temporary correction. It looks like more than that. Various tools, which I teach in my book about how to identify those kind of points where quite possibly yeah, you're looking at something more serious than just a temporary correction. So my shares started reaching the points that I'd set, the stop losses, um, where basically they get sold uh, because they've passed a certain point that I've decided is like a critical point. Okay, so I was selling them one by one. So they were all gone. And now it was time to think about going short. So I set some, uh, some orders in the market, which would be triggered if um, the US index, the S&P 500 fell below a certain point. And then Lehman Brothers collapsed. I was out working as a TV reporter. I was actually going up in a, in a, um, a stunt plane that day. I was the passenger in a stunt plane doing loop the loops and stuff, it was crazy. And when I came down from this plane flight, I looked at my phone and I was making thousands and thousands of pounds. I'd put on these short um, bets. Some of them I'd actually started early. So I'd, it's all a bit complicated, but some of them I'd started earlier. So I'd actually been losing money as the market was rising on, on these bets. And I was getting worried about it. I wrote about this in an article in the Times uh, a few years ago that they asked me to write about how I turned £3,000 into £100,000. And yeah. I did it by doing this. But anyway, once Lehman Brothers crashed, the market started collapsing. I was shorting banking shares. I was doing various other uh, short activity and uh, I was making money as the crash was going on. I didn't shout about this at the time because it would have upset a lot of people. <laughs> but I think with this amount of time elapsed, I can talk about it now uh, because I didn't make the market go down. It was the insolvency of banks that made the market go down. We know that now. But at the time, people were blaming short speculators like me, people who were shorting. Anyway, as, uh, your original question was, was that, you know, what was your crucial moment? That was my crucial moment. That's when I realized, hang on, I've actually seen the possibility of something happening in advance that all the big CEOs and all the big commentators are saying probably isn't going to happen. I saw that it probably was going to happen. I put on the right trades. I made a lot of money out of those trades. And, you know, I'm still thinking of myself as just a little kid amateur trader. And I thought maybe I should take myself a bit more seriously now. So it was a few years after that that I was I decided I was making enough money or more money from trading and investing than I was from my job. Uh, so that's when I decided to stop being a TV reporter full time. I did a bit of it for fun, like uh, on the side for, for a few years. And then I did. And then I just gave it up and concentrated on trading. Yeah, definitely. Right to make, and you mentioned there seven years and some people, you know, they don't want to put that time in and the effort. In, and, you know, even though you're probably doing part time, there's still a lot of you know, hours and hours gone in to actually be able to get to that stage, that turning point. And then from the, now you've been consistent for 13 years. Yes, exactly. It's, um, I mean, you never stop learning. I yeah. have, some years are better than others. Some years I make lots of money. Some years I don't make so much money. It depends quite a lot on what the markets are doing at any particular point. I quite liked it when crypto came along for all kinds of reasons. But one of the reasons was diversification. It meant that I wasn't stuck in traditional markets i was also um exposed now to markets that didn't necessarily correlate with what stock markets were doing so the idea being say if the stock market crashed hopefully crypto wouldn't crash at the same time because they're different things 
as we discovered in March 2020, that's not necessarily always the case. <laughs> everything crashed at once, stocks, crypto, everything. Luckily, I, uh, I saw it in its early stages and I got out uh, with nearly all my money. Uh, but, you know, that was a big, a big shock, that pandemic causing the market to fall heavily. A lot of people lost a lot of money there. Um, but I forgot what your original question was. On that. Oh, no, that's OK. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, th I remember that. And I, I think it was, you know, people were saying it, it was going to go to zero because, you know, there were so many people shorting it. And I think a few exchanges actually, you know, went down because there was so much volatility happening at the time so it, it was very crazy um I, I will mention you sort of mentioned 2008 how you could see that there was the down side in your opinion do you see anything similar today so you know we're seeing quite a lot of uncertainty with inflation and all that stuff are you seeing anything like that in the charts or well yeah i mean there are alarm bells ringing all over the place um but they have been for years it's a really sticky problem a really sticky problem because we have what used to be known as the Greenspan put, named after Alan Greenspan, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve in the States. Basically, the, 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 the term meant every time the markets fall, then in comes the Fed chairman, reduces interest rates or, you know, as we've seen in recent years, prints money and uh, bails out the markets effectively. You know, every time money is printed or money or monetary conditions are eased in that way, it kind of gives the market a boost. And... You know, it's pretty clear that Fed chairmen and women have um, have basically put in uh, a lot of effort to stop the markets from falling. They might deny that that's the reason they're doing it, but I think that's that's why they've been doing it. They don't want to see stock market crashes. Um, and so we're now in a position where, yeah, the, everything's massively overvalued. The markets are crazy, even though there is enormous risk in the markets um, and earnings just don't justify the the stock prices in many cases we're also seeing a lot of stock prices actually f having slowly fallen over uh, the last year or so and the indexes like the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones 30 don't necessarily reflect what's going on in the wider economy because basically they're being held up by the big few stocks that are doing really well like Apple and Amazon and Facebook you know the usual suspects the big the big ones um and Google um you know, some of them have held up, and Tesla, obviously, some of them have uh, held up the market. Uh, and then underneath, there are all these lots and lots and lots of medium sized companies or even large companies, but not super large, that are, their stocks are not doing so well. So it's kind of almost like there's a kind of secret crash going on to some degree. I mean, there's so many things to worry about. But then it's often said the markets climb a wall of worry. Uh, there are always things to worry about. And as, I, as a trend following trader, I'm not going to be out of the market completely. I, I'm, I'm quite light on stocks at the moment, but I'm not going to be out completely until, uh, until the market is no longer rising. Yeah. And that's, as you said there, there's almost like a divide between the big five and the rest of the stocks. And I think, um, you know, there's a classic saying that the stock market doesn't represent the economy, which I think we've seen over the past year where, you know, the economy has gone to Got gone down crazy, especially during COVID, where stocks were reaching all time highs. So I think that divide's never been truer than now. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, though, yeah, with with inflation and low interest rates that we're seeing at the moment, which is sometimes referred to as financial repression, because it means that people are sort of being forced to lose more and more of the value of their money every year because in you know the inflation is so much higher than the return that they can get on their money in the bank uh so their the value of their savings gets eaten away year after year um when you have a situation like that it doesn't necessarily mean stock markets are going to fall in fact under conditions of high inflation like that with lower interest rates uh you often see stocks rising uh quite considerably um as people desperately try and look for somewhere to get a yield on their uh, on their money to try and get some kind of percentage return. So they're looking for good dividends, that kind of thing. Um, though a lot of those really big stocks don't even pay dividends. But, you know, it's another way of betting on, oh, I hope my money goes up instead of just like slowly being eaten away by inflation. So, uh, so yeah, in these kind of conditions, we might see stocks and cryptos continue to rise um, a fair bit further, it's really only when you start to see signs of recession, like unemployment rising, 
um uh in america always in america that's the only place that seems to matter <laughs> you see unemployment rising you see retail sales falling when you see those kinds of things start to happen then i will start worrying very seriously about the stock market but as long as we have this just silly inflation situation yeah i'm worried but i'm not worried enough to like run a mile away from the market yeah, definitely. Well, we're talking obviously a lot about fundamentals, whereas your strategy is completely based on the opposite of technical analysis. Uh, so do you maybe want to talk more about your strategy? I know you mentioned it quite a lot in the book, um, maybe mention, you know, as much as you can without giving all the secrets away uh, and why you focus more on, you know, technical analysis over fundamentals. Are you talking about with stocks or crypto? Uh, just in general, because I know for crypto, you do, you know, you have all these indicators which tell you if you think the market's going to go down and how long you're holding it. Do you do, you do the same for stocks or is it, because I guess the book um, is really on crypto, isn't it? <laughs> you know, with stocks, I am, I pay attention, serious attention to the fundamentals of individual stocks, but okay. I also use chart analysis as well. Uh, with cryptos, the fundamentals are, you know, pie in the sky future stuff. It's kind of like investing. It's like being in Dragon's Den or something. You're investing in an idea most of the time. And most of those ideas are valued for some insane reason in the billions, right? It's like someone walks into Dragon's Den and goes, look, I've invented this bit of software. I reckon it could really catch on in the future. Oh, really? How, how much has it caught on so far? Not at all. Nobody's using it. Uh, but, you know, I, I reckon it will be big in the future. Oh, okay. Well, how much do you think your company should be valued at? Ah, uh, ten billion dollars. It's like what? The, what the hell? Okay, most crypto valuations are just silly. Okay, well, all right, not most, but a lot of them are. And um, as a result, you have to just rely on chart analysis. You have to rely on the uh, sentiment. You know, because the chart reflects what people feel and what people think and what they're prepared to do with their money. By looking at the chart, the price tells you everything you need to know. It tells you where it's heading because it points in a certain direction. And sometimes it changes direction, which means the sentiment has changed, the people's views have changed, the feeling of the people, you know, but people are like a herd, like a wave, you know, they all start feeling optimistic and then they all start feeling pessimistic and they all start feeling optimistic again. You know, that's kind of why charts work so well as a trading tool, because they, they take you with them wherever the people are going. So you can get in and out at the right times, make money out of people being optimistic and then get out before people get too pessimistic when they're only just beginning to get pessimistic. That's that's the key. Um, with stocks, it's different because you've got fundamentals, you've got profits and revenues to hang valuations on. So you can take those seriously. The problem is that, as I say, in recent years, particularly in America, those valuations have become unhooked to fundamentals in many cases. Um, stocks are valued extremely optimistically in many cases. And so it's harder to take fundamentals as seriously as we did, say, 10 years ago. But, you know, they still exist and they're still there and they still provide a bottom for stocks. You know, stocks can only fall so far as long as the business is a decent business, because once a stock falls way, way below what the business is actually worth in terms of bricks and mortar, then somebody could just buy all those stocks sell off the bits and make an absolute fortune from selling off the bits of the business, you know? So, and, and obviously that does happen in real life sometimes when, when a stock is too undervalued. So uh, that kind of provides a, a certain flaw to how far stocks can fall. Whereas you don't have that with many cryptocurrencies, most of them, they could fall 99.9% .9 and, and you could still say they're in line with fundamentals. Yeah, and I like that, you know, following the herd and it's, you know, you'd say Tesla's the classic, you know, the herd loves Tesla, it's going up. So many people have lost so much money trying to short it because they think it's going to go down, whereas, you know, it's just gone through the roof. So, um, I've made money uh, in the past year or two going long Tesla. Yeah. I've also made money shorting Tesla. Okay. It's like because the trends within Tesla's long term upward trend, I mean, it's a very strong long term upward trend it's still in, but along the way, it's had some, you know, massive corrections and those massive corrections downwards along the way provided me with quick shorting opportunities. I don't I very rarely do this kind of scalping quick shorting thing. But for Tesla, I made a bit of an exception yeah. because the corrections are so big that I could get in and out within a matter of days with a profit and then 
wait for Tesla to start going back up again. As I say, I've made money on the long side as well from going long Tesla. So I, I, I don't have any strong feelings either way about Tesla's chart future. I'm happy to long it or short it at the moment. I'm not in a position in Tesla at all. Um, in terms of fundamentals, yeah, you're quite right. It's it's um, it's valued on the future, kind of like like a cryptocurrency. It's valued on what we hope will happen for Tesla in like the next five to ten years. It's not valued according to the cars it's currently selling, not by a long shot, because its market valuation, I think, is isn't it now? Last time I checked, it was more than all the other car companies combined, and yet it sells just a tiny, tiny fraction of the number of cars of most of the big car companies. It's like the the difference is just night and day. It's crazy. I think so. The Elon Musk premium, I think. But um, but one thing you mentioned there is also like, uh, you know, you mentioned hodling in the book and how it can be detrimental to people's long term. You know, you mentioned if someone holds when they were at 20K, went down, you know, they lost 85% of their, their earnings. So I guess it's the same analogy that you use there. And, you know, same with stocks. If you have a, an idea of a short idea, you know, you don't want to hodl it because there's the possibility that it will go completely against you. It's about being flexible in your strategy and what you want to do. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, hodling, <laughs> you know, uh, in stocks, Warren Buffett could possibly be described as a hodler, but I don't really see him that way because hodling is hold on, hold on for dear life was the acronym that was made after the fact. I mean, hodling was just um, somebody spelled holding wrong on a forum once. And uh, and then it sort of caught on as a hodling. And then somebody said, oh, that stands for hold on for dear life. But really, it describes a whole philosophy of Bitcoin is just going to go up forever. And we just got to keep holding on to it. Um, and yeah, there might be ups and downs along the way, but it's just going to keep going up. Well, like I described in the book, I don't know if you saw that bit where I was going on about all the various companies that people thought would just go up forever. And then suddenly they were just not there anymore and everything was ruined. And there are so many examples throughout history. You don't have to go back far at all. Just look at Nokia and BlackBerry from, you know, just over a decade ago. OK, those two companies were conquering the world. OK, they were huge and they were amazing. And everybody talks about Crackberry because we're all addicted like crack to our Blackberries. And everybody had to be on them. And Nokia was selling more phones than anyone else in the world. And everybody had a Nokia and everybody recognized the ringtone. And then Apple brought out the iPhone. And within a couple of years, both companies were just absolutely decimated, like not just damaged, like almost destroyed kind of kind of thing. OK, and now they both exist again, but in like, you know, much smaller ways, much more humble ways. And there are so many examples of that happening to companies. People think Bitcoin is somehow impregnable. I mean, why? There are so many other cryptocurrencies that can do what Bitcoin does. I can make one in five seconds by just copying and pasting the Bitcoin code. OK, then people say, oh, yeah, but the network, you know, it's already built up this big network. And that's true. That is important that a lot of people are on board with the Bitcoin thing. But it's not a one way street. You know, people change, people make different decisions. All these people who are heavily invested in Bitcoin and in the and in the upkeep of the network, they might just, you know, hop onto something that looks better. In fact, some of them do hop onto things that look better. And there are lots of other cryptocurrencies. And yeah, Bitcoin might might continue to be the biggest player forever. It might, but then it might not. Like, what's wrong with everybody with the, their prophecies? What are they all Nostradamus? They all know what's going to happen in the future, what people are going to decide, because that's ultimately what this is about. It's about what people, what the people are going to decide. How, how can anybody be so arrogant and say, yeah, in 20 years time, the people will be using Bitcoin as their main cryptocurrency? They definitely will. It's like, what do you know? What do you know, idiot? Not you personally. But. Yeah, no, it's all right. Um, but yeah, I think it's like when you look 30 years ago, what the largest stocks in the US were, and it's like ExxonMobil, uh, you know, all, all those different companies and the exact same thing, what you mentioned there. You know, these massive companies, they might not be there. The market might always go up, but that's because there's, you know, new emergence coming through and they're, you know, becoming bigger and bigger. So, you know, will Amazon and Google and all these companies be the largest? You know, will Bitcoin be the largest in 10, 15 years? Who knows? Likely because the biggest companies in the world don't tend to stay the biggest companies in the world for more than a few decades. It's just the way things tend to work. And people keep saying, oh, it's different this time. You know, these guys are too big to fail. And it's like, mm, really? I mean, even with Facebook, let's just talk about Facebook briefly, because, you know, even though it just seems to go from strength to strength financially, 
I mean, we've heard a lot of bad talk about it for years. It has a terrible reputation among many people in, say, the United States. And, and in fact, most of the English speaking countries is not considered like a good guy, is it? Let's face it. Um, and 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 also, of course, young people aren't using Facebook yet. They're using Instagram and WhatsApp, which are, of course, owned by Facebook, which accounts for quite a lot of its um, financial uh, buoyancy. But again, you know, kids move on to other things. I mean, I'm I'm on TikTok. I'm a crazy kid. I'm on TikTok all the time. I, I don't post videos on there. I literally just scroll through like a kid does because I find it entertaining. I don't find Instagram entertaining anymore. I wonder how many other kids uh, are feeling that way. I don't know. I, I'm just speculating here. I'm just saying, you know, no giant can just never be toppled. Even Google came out of nowhere and toppled another giant or various other sort of big search giants at the time. And maybe one day somebody will come up with some brilliant, brilliant quantum uh, computing based algorithm, which just beats the hell out of Google's search algorithm. And then suddenly everyone will move to that. We all don't care about Google. We're not going to be, oh, I'm loyal to Google. No, we'll just switch to the new thing and then Google will be dead. You know, I don't know. I mean, it's just obviously that's an unlikely scenario, but you can see that it's possible could happen. Yeah, definitely. As you said there, Yahoo was massive. And then we all went to Google, you know, MySpace back for anyone who remembers in 2006 or whatever. Then we all went to Facebook. You know, we're, we're constantly moving to the new hip thing. Um, oh, you're too, just one quick thing. You're too young to remember. You young people. You're too young <laughs> to remember AOL, America Online, and how it was the biggest thing. Not in this country, but in uh, America. It was just, you know, it basically was the Internet. Yeah. Um, everybody or a lot of people um, accessed the internet in the 90s through the AOL portal and were just kind of within a walled garden of AOL so it was like they owned the internet almost uh, from the point of view of a lot of Americans and and then they did the biggest um, merger of all time with Time Warner um, and it was kind of billed as a new media company takes over an old media company and uh, and then within a few years they were like nothing so it's, you know, again, anyway, there's just enough examples. Sorry, you were going to ask another question. I oh, know, that's okay. So um, what I was going to say is the book was released in 2019 and obviously the market, you know, it was at sort of a low. Now we've seen a massive upshoots, you know, 10 times. Uh, I think it was, you mentioned like $8,000 US dollars for Bitcoin. So it's gone up quite a lot since then. Um, so say if you were to update the book at all or change it, what, what would you, would you make any changes at all? Or would you do anything in that regard? Um, if you were the release yeah, it today, not not many, but what would I include? I mean, trading techniques remain the same. Okay, that's the main thing. the The meat and veg of the book remains the same because trading is eternal. It seems it works across all different markets. The patterns work. The charts move in the same way. The same kind of ups and downs. The same little patterns forming along the way, where where charts kind of go sideways, banging against a kind of uh, invisible ceiling for a while, and then burst through it, which we call a breakout. You know, all that kind of stuff. It happens in crypto as in everything else, because humans are humans, and when humans are trading, that's how they trade. And even when algorithms are trading, when they're taught to trade, they tend to trade in the same way because they're taught by humans. The algorithms are taught by humans. Maybe in the near, in the distant future, with machine learning. Uh, computers will learn to trade in different ways, but so far I see little sign of that uh, that happening or being or coming through in the uh, in the actual data, the price data. Um, but 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 what would I change in the book then? Um, well, I'd update the prices for a start, but some of them were quite low, like you know Bitcoin. Ten thousand dollars or whatever, you know, when I'm using it as an example in the book. Yeah, uh, there's, there's a few uh, inch, like you mentioned, Dash and a few of those other coins that have just sort of gone into obscurity. <laughs> you don't hear about them anymore. <laughs> exactly, Dash was like massive, and actually, that's a really useful thing for people to notice in the book. The, the book is almost all a historical document in itself already after <laughs> like two years, because um, you know some of the examples used in the book are they just examples, so it doesn't matter. But the, mm. but some of them are. Uh, as you say, obsolete now. And actually people should pay attention to that. When you look at things like Sol in the cryptocurrency market, Solana and, uh, and Ada, Cardano, some of the big cryptos right now, you know, they, they could be the, the dash of 2021. You could see these things 
um, go out of fashion and new ones take their places. You know, there's, people need to get some sense of historical perspective is what I'm saying, not just hold on for dear life, assuming that things will go up forever. Some of those big names of 2017 are still way lower price wise than they were in 2017. OK, even though Bitcoin is three times what it was in 2017 or two and a half times right now, um, you know, a lot of those other cryptos never recovered. And a lot of people have put a lot of money into those cryptos and they've never got that money back. So you, you do need to be careful and not just hold on for dear life. That's why I trade using the charts, because you need to see those big trends. And when a big trend is heading downwards, sometimes it just goes down and down and down and down and just carries on down forever until it's zero. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens. Um, so what would I change in my book? What would I change? I would, yeah, apart from that, apart from just little things like the prices, um, I would talk more about decentralized exchanges. And actually I'm going to update my website soon with information about decentralized exchanges because, uh, you know, some of the stuff that's come along in recent times in the DeFi uh, area like Uniswap and so on. They work in a slightly different way from centralized exchanges, but you know, it can be learned. It's, uh, it's, it's not difficult. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There are things, things I would change, but nothing major. The book still remains as relevant as ever. Yeah, go buy it. <laughs> it was definitely great. What, would you mention anything about NFTs or would you, I don't I know. I would mention them, but I yeah. don't trade NFTs because you can't really trade them using uh charts or patterns or or um you know they have no charts so you just basically you're trading uh nfts um like you would uh baseball cards or stamps right it's like stamp collecting uh for the 21st century is the way i like to describe it that's the best analogy i think i've come up with so far is stamp collecting because you know there's no there's no buying and selling charts and seeing the momentum of a particular nft in the same way it's just much harder to gauge which way they're going basically you need to be in a tight community like the stamp collecting community and know everything about the different types of stamps or nfts and then you can kind of work out which ones might have long-term potential and which ones are just crappy pixelated pictures that nobody's ever going to want because they're all crap well not all of them but some of them are some of the crappy pixelated pictures are worth a lot of money and some of the crappy pixelated pictures are worth no money so, you know you need to be an expert to know the difference between those two uh so you need to immerse yourself in the community in that world and that it's not my world um so yeah, I would add a bit an introduction about it in the book, but it's not something that I personally want to get involved in because as I say, you have to become part of that and it takes up a lot of time. The people I know who are really into that world takes up a lot of their time and their life talking about JPEGs with people all the time. <laughs> it's, not, it's not my bag, baby, you know? You're on Discord 24 seven. That's what I've noticed. <laughs> and, really the, and looking at those communities and if they're legit or not. So so, you know, in journalism, there's, there always has to be a reason why the market moves. And then the, you know, retail traders, you know, they, they basically listen to the news and they'll trade in that regard based on the news, based on the noise. And it can be very negative sometimes and it's always very extreme. So do you think that traders listening to that news can have an impact on their, their results? Yes. It has a big impact on their results, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of traders make make decisions based on what they hear. And the problem is by the time you hear the news, it's generally already priced into the market. So it's usually already too late to act on it. Um, you know, news happens quickly and markets respond instantly. So unless you're a computer, <laughs> unless your head is a computer that can trade instantly, then uh, there's not a lot of point trading on most news items. It's too late. Uh, the price has already moved by the time you lift up your fingers to the keyboard or to your phone. So, um, yeah, I mean, as the, the story you're referring to in my book uh, is about how, uh, as a business reporter, I would uh, be told, right, report on the, the impact of the latest inflation figures on the market. And basically, regardless of what had happened, what the announcement was, I would be expected to post hoc come up with an explanation for it when there wasn't necessarily an obvious explanation for why the market had moved the way it did. Sometimes, sometimes it does the opposite of what the market goes the opposite way to what uh, the analysts were expecting. So you're either saying analysts expected this move or analysts didn't expect this move or, you know, it's just, 
and 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 the story was that I had to kind of come up with a you know because often they'll say oh um, the market went up because um, analysts were disappointed with the inflation decision but then if the market had gone the other way I just would have said analysts were happy with the inflation decisions even though the inflation decision was the exact same thing because there are always some analysts who think the one thing and some analysts think the other thing so there will always be some disappointed analysts and there will always be some happy analysts <laughs> so you could just refer to them but the, the point is it's all just meaningless the, the stuff that that uh, journalists say for why the markets have moved is usually just something that they just made up to justify to their boss that they have a reason but usually they just really don't have a clue what's going on most people don't have a clue what's going on the markets often only reveal their reasons for why they've moved in a certain way months after the event it quite often works that way, you know, and, and actually recessions are a perfect example of that. You will often see uh, a recession happen many, many months, like six months after a market starts falling. But at the time the market starts falling, no, nobody expects a recession, or at least the experts don't. But some of the insider traders, the people who know better, people who run businesses, that kind of thing, they're seeing something bad on the horizon. They're starting to sell out of their stocks and, uh, and the market starts falling over a period of months. But you won't find... The newspapers talking about why not the true reason for why that's happening because they don't know it yet it's only many months later they suddenly find out all oh, the latest figures have come out looks like we're in a recession so do you see what i mean it's like trading on news is a mugs game uh really i do oh, I, I don't know anybody who got rich trading on news put it that way yeah definitely i agree and it's a classic uh trade the rumor and then sell the news i think that's the classic yeah, thing. that often works as a better maxim than the other the other way around yeah yeah definitely i'm not advised there but uh but glenn thank you so much for joining me on the what the finance podcast on uh christmas eve so thank you for <laughs> sacrificing your time with your family um just sort of on to my last question what is one message that you'd like listeners to take away from and to other than buy the book <laughs> which you should uh, Cut your losses. That's the number one message in my book. You'll have seen me say it over and over again, but it's impossible to say it too many times because it's so hard to get through people's heads, even through my own head. OK, you know, because when something is falling, when you've bought something and you've got this feeling in your head, yeah, I think it's going to go up a lot. But then it starts going down and it goes down below the point where you bought it. Right. The the successful traders and a lot of the successful investors in this world do not hang on to losing trades, okay? Most of them, most of the ones I've ever come across who've made a lot of money do not hang on to losing trades because if you hang on to losing trades and make big losses on particular trades, it means that you can't afford to make other mistakes with your other trades, right? You've lost big amounts of money and you have to make up those losses somehow and that's hard much easier way to trade and much more easier way to invest is to uh, when something's not doing what you expected it to do get out of it quick so i try and only make small losses uh just little ones right and you can have lots of those little ones because they're little so it's fine they don't matter that much you can have a lot of them and with that you can then make all kinds of other stupid mistakes and but still have a few big winners that you let ride and ride upwards and uh, you make lots of money on those winners and they much more than cancel out the small losers. That is how the big guys tend to make their money in this game. So I cannot, I cannot stress that enough. Cut your losses short, as in cut them while they're still small. And as I say, it's hard for people to get that through their heads because nobody likes taking a loss. Everybody wishes that the thing will go back up again. And sometimes it does go back up again and then they're vindicated and they go, oh, yeah, you see, I was right to hold on through my loss. And, and now it's gone back up. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Quite often they will just carry on going down and you'll make a massive loss. And eventually you'll have to bite the bullet and sell and take that big loss. But um, it's much better to take them when they're small and you'll have to take them often when they're small, which is painful. But it's uh, it's well worth doing in the long run. It will make uh, make you much more likely to be a successful investor or successful trader. Great advice. I think for a lot of us, unfortunately, uh, we have to learn the hard way <laughs> a few times by <laughs> letting it run and be like, wait, that was a mistake. <laughs> I know I've done that a few times. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. So Glenn, thank you so much. If anyone wanted to buy the book or maybe um, stay in contact with you and see more of your content, what would the best way for that be? Uh, just at Glenn Goodman on Twitter and my website is glengoodman.com. Uh, those are the best ways. Perfect. Sounds good. And Amazon for the book. But yep, yeah, Glenn, thanks again for the interview. No problem. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.